Let's get started, everyone. It's 12 o'clock. I want to get started with the latest webinar as part of the New York State J Association 2018-2019 webinar series. Uh, I have an excellent, excellent presentation uh, and presenter uh, for you this, uh, this uh, great cold month, uh, at least here in the East Coast. Um, uh, Amanda um, LaJose here will be providing us uh, great insight information uh, on some presentation skills. And the, while this is not specific to GIS, I think it's certainly uh, relevant to any professional development. Um, and within the GIS field and communities is something that uh, we, we, all, we, we know all too well in terms of uh, any mapping or any data uh, and, and being able to communicate that clearly through our visuals and our uh, data points, as well as during presentations. So I'm looking forward to this presentation and certainly uh, to benefit from uh, from the bits and pieces uh, of, uh, of gold nuggets from Amanda. So uh, without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to Amanda, allow her to get into uh, letting us know a little bit more about herself and get her right into that presentation. We will have a Q&A at the end of the session. So hold your questions. Uh, and Amanda will be uh, able to uh, get back to there. We are recording this webinar. Uh, and with that, Amanda, thank you very much. You can get going. OK, thank you so much for that introduction. I greatly appreciate it. Um, my name is Dr. Amanda Loheiser. And I am going to go into screen sharing mode here. So just uh, bear with me for one second. Um, desktop sharing mode. You should be able to see the presentation. And uh, I am going to open this up. Give me one moment here. OK, so I am going to share the whole screen here. And um, I realize that there's no way for me to check and see if everybody can see the screen. Um, Rosie, can you tell me that you can see the screen? Okay, very good. Thank you. Some feedback from the audience. Does everyone see the screen? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, right. very good. And very I will get started. So, sorry. Okay, um, so this is a presentation that I put together uh, on presentation skills, which is how to handle what I would like to think is almost anything in a presentation that you may encounter. So uh, a little bit about me, just to let you know uh, a little bit more about who I am. Uh, my name is Dr. Amanda Loheiser, and uh, that last name, Loheiser, actually kind of a, a funny thing. Uh, it was von Niederhauser when we came over from Switzerland in the early 1800s. And uh, I like to think the story uh, was, at least we, well, the bits and pieces we know of it, is my ancestor, Johannes von Niederhauser, and got off the ship. I picture them kind of getting off the ship like the von Trapp family, like all lined up. And uh, he walked up to the customs agent and he said, what's your name? And he said, Johannes von Niederhauser, presumably in German. And uh, the customs agent says, welcome to America, John Loheiser and uh, our name was born. So my only regret in life is that if it had stayed Von Niederhauser, now I would be Dr. Von Niederhauser. And I kind of think that sounds like a James Bond villain, like I need you know, a cat and a, a white lab coat. Uh, but in any case, I got my doctorate in, uh, in communication studies. Uh, so I am an assistant professor of communication studies at the State University of New York at Fredonia. And uh, before that, I was a full-time lecturer in communication studies at the Singapore Institute of Management. Which, was a, which is a satellite campus of the State University of New York at Buffalo. And before that, I was a graduate teaching assistant. And uh, prior to that, I worked as a communication specialist in public relations and marketing for a local Buffalo-based public relations firm. So my work experience has always involved some element of presenting to groups. Now, my education is in communication. My focus has always been on socio-emotional intelligence. Um, I'm really intrigued in how people use emotional information to be better communicators. And we don't realize it, but a lot of our presentation skills 
come from emotional intelligence, understanding our own emotions, understanding what other people might be feeling too. I'm also certified in the facial action coding system and in the microexpressions training certificate. That's through the Paul Ekman group. If anybody has ever watched uh, the TV show Lie to Me, uh, that is all based on Paul Ekman's research, although from my understanding, the actual Paul Ekman is a bit more congenial and friendly than the uh, fictional counterpart of Cal Lightman on that series. And I have a Master of Science in Public Relations. I've actually returned to Buff State to get a second Master's in Creativity and Change Leadership. And my undergraduate is also in Communication from SUNY Buffalo. So I'd like to draw on these life experiences of my education and my work background to put together this presentation for you today on how to handle just about anything that might happen to you when you're presenting. So the first thing we're going to go into is mental preparation for your presentation. The next thing we're going to look at are the specifics of your presentation style. Then we're going to talk about how to interact with your audience. And then for number four, we're going to handle the source of many people's fear when they're presenting, which is what to do when something or someone interrupts your flow of presentation. So these are the four main areas we're going to cover today. And as Rosie said at the very end of the presentation, I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and responding to those. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started by talking about mental preparation for your presentation. Now, you might have heard people tell you over and over again that the best way to prepare is to practice, practice, practice. And that's very true. That's all well and good. Uh, but I think that sometimes people don't quite know what should go into the actual practice. Like, what does that mean, practicing your presentation? The best way to practice a presentation is to actually rehearse your entire presentation in front of another living, breathing human being. Don't skip anything. Don't say to the person, okay, this is where I'm going to introduce this topic and then I'll talk about this thing. Actually talk about it. Deliver each slide. Deliver each point. If you're giving a speech, go through your actual introduction. Go through every point of your speech. And then ask that person for feedback. Now, this part, and I'm speaking from my own personal experience here, this part can be intimidating because you're, you're kind of opening yourself up to somebody to deliver a presentation and then say to them, okay, what would you change? What, what did I do wrong? But getting that constructive criticism from somebody that you trust, somebody who's got your best interests at heart, that can be extremely helpful because they're going to give you tips from the perspective of the audience, which is a really important perspective to get. And then after you've gone through that, after you've gotten your constructive criticism and hopefully taken it to heart as well-meaning uh, information, you need to rehearse that presentation until you really, really know it. Um, we're going to talk about not relying on note cards in a minute, but this is part of that process of really rehearsing because rehearsal equals comfort. And when you're comfortable with your material, you're confident in your presentation. So the best way to boost confidence is to know your material backwards and forwards. As I said before, uh, ditching the note cards is another way to boost your confidence. It's a really good way to practice. The, the most sure way to look unsure in a presentation is to hide behind your note cards or even the note fields on PowerPoint. Because what happens when you're looking at note cards, even if you feel like you're looking up at the audience, you're really not. You're going to start to lose that eye contact. You're going to end up hiding behind the podium. And very dangerously, you're going to find that you go into reading mode because no matter how much you think you're going to look up at the audience, you're going to forget and you're going to start relying on those note cards. Another danger of becoming reliant on your note cards is that you are becoming psychologically dependent on those note cards. Even if you feel like, well, I know the presentation really well, but I just feel more comfortable having these cards in my hand. What happens if, as you're getting up to present, somebody spills coffee on your note cards? Or you drop the note cards and they all shuffle out of order? Now you've got a psychological trigger of, I've lost this thing that I was depending on. And you don't want to feel that way. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you're dependent on something to be there, that if something happens to it or if you lose it, you feel like you've lost some of your control. So my advice is to ditch the cards entirely, know your material backwards and forwards, and use your PowerPoint slides as your note cards. 
put enough text on your slides so that your audience can follow along and they also act as your own prompts. So when I'm presenting to you today, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the same PowerPoint in front of me that you're seeing in front of you. Um, and it's also useful if there's a word or a name or something that you're fearful that you're going to forget or make a mistake on. Um, I actually, I had an experience fairly recently, within the last couple of years, I put together this presentation for a guest lecture for a class. And uh, one of the points in the presentation, I was referencing back to different people, uh, different well-known figures, and I had a picture of Marilyn Monroe on one of my slides. And I knew this stuff backwards and forwards. I was super confident. And I did a rehearsal with a colleague. And for reasons totally unknown to me, like I don't even listen to this guy's music. I don't know what happened. Some little synapse in my brain crossed over. And when I had this picture of Marilyn Monroe up on my slide, I referenced her as Marilyn Manson. I still don't know why. And my colleague, of course, bursts out laughing. I burst out laughing. I'm like, OK, when I give the actual presentation, I'm going to know that it's Marilyn Monroe. Obviously, I know who this is. But this moment stuck in my head. And that one mistake kept playing itself over and over in my head. And by the time I got to the day of the presentation, I had convinced myself that I was going to talk about Marilyn Manson instead of Marilyn Monroe. So what I did is I put a little name tag under the picture. I went through the whole presentation. And anywhere I had a picture of a person, I just put their name just in tiny print so that if an audience member was sitting there, it would look very intentional. Like they would look at it and say, oh, OK, she's putting the names of the people under the pictures. But I knew that when I got to that slide, that slide that had set me up with this nervous anticipation, I knew that I could glance at it and have the name in front of me so that I wouldn't have to run into the issue of thinking I would forget it. So if there's anything that you think you might be forgetting, put it in there in a way that just looks intentional and casual. And then you can have it to refer to. And don't be afraid to use images. Studies have shown that people remember information and process information better if they're also seeing some image that ties the words you're saying and the words they're reading to an image. Uh, it's a reason why illustrations and textbooks are so helpful. So do the same thing with your presentation. Use those images. Don't go overboard with images. Uh, but use a few just to create some sense of interest and to give people something to focus on. It makes your slides visually appealing, and it's also going to serve to remind you of those key points. Now, the next bit of mental preparation you can do is to calm yourself. And uh, while we would love to be able to just like pause life and go to a yoga studio or go sit on the beach before you present, uh, for the most part, that's not a possibility. So my recommendation is to take a moment to center yourself before presenting. And centering techniques can include a lot of different things that work for different people. Uh, for me, I'll take a moment and I'll close my eyes or I'll just unfocus my gaze for a moment, take a mental trip somewhere that calms you. I took this photograph uh, when I was vacationing in Puerto Rico a couple of years ago. And when I look at it, not only am I looking at the beautiful sand and the water, but I'm also remembering a moment that I felt really calm. I was with family. Uh, we were on a vacation. We were relaxed. And so when I look at this photo, it calms me. I keep this picture in my Google Photos on my phone. And if I need to, I can look at it for a moment. And it feels like it takes me away from where I am. And it lets me take this little mental trip. So you might want to even imagine sounds like waves lapping the shore. You might want to silently recite a favorite verse or a mantra you might have that calms you. Um, have a photo with you that makes you feel happy. Take a couple of deep, full breaths. Not those hyperventilating kind of breaths, but an actual deep breath and gently release it. And this does a couple of things. It calms you down. It blasts your bloodstream with a little dose of oxygen, just getting totally scientific here. And it lets you relax. It opens your lungs, which makes you project better for presenting. So calming techniques are not just something for you mentally. They're actually going to help you physically calm yourself as well. Now, here's some confidence building, what I like to call pre-game strategies. Um, you want to go with your regular caffeine intake. If you don't consume caffeine to start with, don't start on the morning of your presentation. Don't consume extra caffeine than you normally would. Uh, if you normally have a cup of coffee, don't ditch that cup of coffee. So not extra, not less, same amount you normally do. Eat and drink simply before your presentation. 
Um, no Tums commercial foods. You know what I'm talking about there. No alcohol. Basically, every rom-com that has a, a wedding speech will tell you the disasters of combining alcohol with public speaking. Wear something that you've worn before. An outfit that you feel comfortable in, that you feel confident in, that you're not testing out a brand new outfit on the day of the presentation. Make sure you get enough sleep. Uh, being well rested is going to help you on so many levels. And you want to get to your destination early to avoid any stress. Uh, my rule of thumb is if you're traveling somewhere to give a presentation or go to a meeting, you want to take the normal amount of time that it takes you and add at least 30 minutes to that time. Uh, because you can use that early time for things that are going to help you. Use the bathroom. Do a mirror check. Uh, check your face. Do a little twirl. Do what you want to do. Um, but that helps you to see how you look from the audience's perspective. You want to get to the place that you're presenting, to the room that you're going to be in, get your supplies in place, get a glass of water ready, uh, get anything you need that's going to make you feel comfortable. Launch that PowerPoint ahead of time, get it set up, and then visit with a few audience members. You might want to take a few moments then and center yourself after you've done that. So the big takeaway here for mental presentation preparation is you have the power to set yourself up for success. You can do this by knowing your presentation inside and out, making yourself feel prepared. You can build confidence through your appearance. And you can use these mini meditation techniques to center yourself right before you present. So now let's look at presentation style. Conversational speaking is something that you want to practice and something that is going to really help you be an engaging presenter. We've all had those experiences with monotone speakers. They're usually people who don't fluctuate their tone at all, and they talk on one note, and it gives you the feeling that they're not really excited about their material. Conversational speech, on the other hand, varies in tonality. Your voice naturally rises and falls in pitch and volume. And those kinds of things make you feel comfortable, and it makes your audience feel comfortable, too, because they now feel like they're part of a conversation. And if they feel engaged, they're going to give you that energy back as you're presenting. Also, knowing that presentation backwards and forwards helps you to tell about your material instead of reciting your material. If you start reciting your presentation, you can often slide into that monotone. But if you're telling about something, you're excited. And your most animated conversational speech happens when you're excited about something. Think about a story that you told a friend recently, like some story that you could not wait to tell a friend or a colleague, and think about how your voice sounded. Think about how you approached that story. Uh, the moral of the story here, I think, is get excited about your topic. If you're presenting about something that you do in your career, chances are you've chosen that career because you like what you do. So share that excitement of what you do with your audience, and they'll get excited too. Now, an important thing to consider is moderating your speed. And uh, I love this quote by Ann Landers. She says, the trouble with talking too fast is you may say something you haven't thought of yet. So moderating your speed is a way to always be kind of mentally checking yourself as you talk. Now, people naturally speak fast when they're presenting. And again, this goes back to psychology. Psychologically, you want to get it over with. So in the back of your mind, you're thinking, if I can just race through this, it'll be done, and I'll be on the other side of it. Unfortunately, it's really hard to follow people who are talking too quickly. So my best advice to you is to slow way down. If it sounds agonizingly slow in your head, chances are you're speaking at a good conversational volume. And the best way to tell how fast you're talking, unfortunately, is to record yourself practicing. And I can speak from experience that this is one of those agonizing experiences that makes you just kind of want to curl up in on yourself. Um, it's kind of angst-inducing watching yourself presenting, but it's really the best way to tell if you're talking too fast. You can also use a clock. Uh, you can check in at different points and create benchmarks for yourself. I've done that for this presentation. Uh, I have my phone silenced, of course, but I have it in front of me with a digital clock. And then for me, time has a shape. I need to see an analog clock. So whenever I'm presenting, I have an analog clock somewhere in view. Most rooms already have a clock, 
If they don't, there are settings on your phone that you can set an analog clock onto your phone. But you can check in with yourself, check in with the time, and uh, make sure you're at the point you need to be. Now, how about walking back and forth? Uh, for this, I like to compare park and bark to pacing. So park and bark is a phrase that I actually first heard from reading an article about the Oscars in 2014. Um, and Dina Menzel of Let It Go fame, any of you with, uh, you know, within like a five mile proximity to a small child, you probably are familiar with the movie Frozen. Um, and Dina Menzel sang the song uh, Let It Go and it became so wildly popular that she presented it at the Oscars. And I read in this interview that she was so nervous about singing that song live because it had become such a cultural icon that when she began the performance, she told people ahead of time, I'm going to park and bark. I'm just going to stand in one place and I'm going to sing the song. And she did, and she nailed it, it was awesome. Um, but the important thing here is that you need to know what is comfortable for you for presenting. Sometimes if it's a case where there is a lot riding on a presentation, standing in one place might be the best way to go. But you wanna to try to find a balance. Park and bark is where you stand in one spot while you speak and you don't move. Pacing, on the other hand, is on the entirely end of that spectrum. Um, pacing is a visually unnerving, repetitive, fast walk. And I'm sure you've attended presentations where you've seen this, where people feel nervous, they've got pent up energy, and so they channel it through pacing. A little bit of moving back and forth though is good because if you're speaking to an entire room, it's a great way to engage your audience. So my advice is to find a balance between park and bark and pacing. You might start by, as you're speaking, walking slowly to one side of the audience and stand as you finish a thought. If I were speaking to you in person today, I'd be illustrating this. Uh, however, I'm stuck in one place in a chair, so I'm just kind of illustrating it through the slide animation here. Then, as you're making your next point, stroll to the other side of the audience as you're making that point. Stand there to make your third point, and then, as you're making your fourth point, stroll again. So this way, you're not catching yourself in that rhythmic back and forth pacing. Instead, it's planned out, and it's a little bit more fluid, and it's also giving the audience a feeling that you're standing and talking to them at different points in different parts of the room. Another bit of advice is to invest in a clicker or uh, using a, a wireless mouse instead of using the advanced key on your keyboard or their mouse. Just like note slides, if you're using the advanced key or a mouse, it traps you behind the podium. If you're just using that advanced key on the keyboard, you have to always be in front of that keyboard before you can make your next point. Uh, invest in a clicker. This is my clicker. I'm using it today because when I rehearsed this uh, using a camera, I rehearsed this with a colleague over Skype just to make sure things were working okay. I realized that every time I advanced on my keyboard, I was leaning forward and it just wasn't a good look for the presentation. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna plug in my clicker and I'm going to use it just like I would be lecturing. Uh, I got this clicker on Amazon at, for about $14. Please don't quote me on this price. Things might've changed since then, but hey, with uh, Black Friday, you might get it cheaper. Um, hook up this clicker long before you start speaking. You don't want to have to wait for the computer to authenticate the software as you're standing and trying to introduce yourself. A clicker, what I like about a clicker is that it allows you to walk as you advance through your slides, it lets you control your own flow. Instead of having somebody else saying, oh, I'll advance through the slides for you, that can be tricky sometimes because you have to either you know, give them a visual or a nod, or they might advance too quickly, or they might not advance when you want them to. So you're in control of your presentation. Again, confidence is all about having control, and a uh, clicker lets you do this. And it liberates you from that podium or the desk. You're no longer hiding behind it. You can engage with your audience. So the big takeaways here are to speak conversationally instead of reciting. Comfort with your presentation should allow for this. Be aware of how you move when you speak. Try to avoid nervous pacing. And you want to unshackle yourself from that podium with a clicker. So now let's talk a little bit about audience interaction. Um, a lot of people cite being in front of a group as a thing that makes them nervous. Some people say, you know, I feel uncomfortable with all these people watching me. I become really aware of what I'm doing and it makes me feel self-conscious. Um, this is where giving yourself that extra time when you arrive to present is really helpful because you can use this time to meet and greet. 
As I said before, when we talked about arriving early to set up your room, you also want to use that time to talk to people. Um, you might know a couple of people in the audience. So chat with somebody that you know in the audience and take a few minutes to socialize with some new folks. Just shake their hands, talk to them, introduce yourself, get to know them. You don't necessarily need to connect with everybody in the room. That might not be possible if it's a big room of people. Um, but if you connect with a couple of people, now when you start presenting, you are no longer talking to a room full of strangers. You're talking to a couple people you know and a couple of people you just introduced yourself to. When you're actually talking to that group, look for the really responsive listeners in different spots of the room. Uh, this is something that makes webinars kind of unique, actually, is that I'm just talking into a camera right now. I have to kind of imagine a room full of responsive listeners. Uh, but when you're actually talking to people in a room, uh, this is what a room looks like to me. First, it starts out where you don't know anybody. And then you look for those responsive people. You look for the people that are making direct eye contact. You look for the people who are nodding. Uh, you look for the people that are taking down notes and looking as they're taking down notes. And those are the people you want to focus on during your presentation. As you speak, make eye contact with those people. Try to mark a few people in different spots in the room. And now when you're speaking, your eyes are going to naturally sweep the entire room because you're making eye contact with those people in different points. And by making eye contact throughout the room, you engage the whole room. All of these things come down to presenting with people, not at people. And uh, I'm going to geek out with communication studies for just a moment. This is the major difference between a one-way model of communication where you're talking at people and a two-way model of communication where you're inviting feedback. So the tips with eye contact helps a lot with this because if you're making eye contact with somebody, they're going to feel like you're presenting directly to them. Speaking conversationally and not pacing will also change the situation from you presenting to people to you presenting at. So moving from one side of the audience to the other, making direct eye contact with those people gives that feeling of engagement. And another bit of advice is to imagine yourself in the audience. Take a moment to actually picture yourself sitting in the chair watching yourself present. And try to think of what would engage you as an audience member. You know, think back to speakers that you've seen that you found to be really engaging. What did they do? How did they connect with you? And then try to emulate that behavior. Now, at the very beginning of the presentation, we established that we would be taking questions at the end. And establishing when you take questions is a really important part of audience interaction. And it actually is going to come into our next section in a little bit on what to do if something interrupts your flow. It is absolutely OK to tell the audience when you're going to take questions. Just do this ahead of time. Do this in the beginning before you get a question. Otherwise, it creates an awkward situation where you have to say, oh, OK, but I wasn't going to take questions. I was going to do it at the end. And then it creates a sense of awkwardness. But if you tell people ahead of time, um, I'm looking forward to taking your questions at the end. Uh, or you might say something like, I'm going to be covering three stages of my study. And at the end of each stage, I'll be inviting questions. Or if you've got a really casual speaking environment, you might even say, feel free to ask questions anytime as I'm presenting today. But let the audience know so that they know what to expect, so that you don't end up with an awkward situation of somebody sitting with their hand up during your presentation. But most importantly, follow through. Make sure you do. Make sure you take those questions at the end of the section or at the end of your presentation or throughout your presentation if that's what's you, what you invited from your audience. Uh, now, this next part is really in my wheelhouse. This is using body language to interact. I get really excited about this material because it's something that I've spent a lot of time uh, training in and studying. Um, in addition to eye contact and tone of voice, there's other ways you can use nonverbal communication to your advantage as a speaker. Now, nonverbal communication is everything you're communicating when you're not using words. So, I put together this little chart here uh, that I like to call do this, not this, because it communicates this. These are some common things that I've observed speakers doing uh, or that I've even done myself that I've had to break myself of and a little bit of the science behind what it's actually communicating. So when you're presenting, keep your hands making open gestures or holding your clicker. 
don't clasp your hands in front of you. Uh, in the biz, we call this the fig leaf for some fairly obvious reasons. And it is actually, it comes right out of psychology. You are, you are, so you're, you're expressing your sense of fear. Um, the fig leaf especially is a subconscious desire to protect yourself and to cover yourself. So keep your hands open, making open gestures. Don't clasp them in front of you. Try to be aware of your hands and what they're doing. Um, especially if you're confronted with a question, it's very common without even realizing it to close your hands into fists, even at your side. Um, and this communicates hostility. Even if you don't mean to be hostile, even if you're not feeling hostile, clenched fists signifies that you're preparing for a fight or that you're fearful or that you're angry. So be aware of those hands. Keep your arms relaxed and open. Don't cross your arms uh, because this makes you look closed off and aloof. Um, putting your hands on your hips can look like you are hostile or that you are, again, aloof. So if you relax your arms, keep your hands loose. Don't put them in your pockets. Uh, putting your hands in your pockets can communicate shiftiness or being overly casual or sometimes even being careless. And uh, the interesting thing about nonverbal communication is it's very much receiver oriented. That means you guys, that means the audience. I may not intend to be communicating that I'm aloof by standing with my arms crossed, but if it's a message that you receive, it's what you're going to interpret about that speaker. You also want to pay attention to uh, your nervous body language on a day-to-day -day basis. So figure out what your tells are. Maybe ask a good friend, a nice friend, um, what do you notice I do when I'm speaking? You know, do I have anything that I do when I'm nervous? I had discovered that mine was playing with jewelry, you know, playing with earrings or something, or playing with a necklace. Uh, so once I discovered this about myself, I stopped doing it. Um, I tried, you know, it, it's tough because sometimes you go back to those actions without even thinking about it, but try to be aware of what you do ahead of time. Um, any of these actions like twirling your hair, playing with jewelry, spinning a pen, biting your fingers, these behaviors are called adapters and they are subconscious ways that we channel stress. And adapters communicate nervousness. They communicate restless energy. Um, they're designed to channel stress and your audience is going to interpret it that way. So try to be aware of these things and try to keep your body language relaxed. And again, feeling relaxed and confident is going to create this body language as well. So the big takeaway here is that your audience is comprised of people, not a faceless mass. Try to remember that. These are actual human beings listening to you, watching you present, and they've been there too. Arrive with enough time to get to know them. Try to, to put faces to names, names to faces, so that when you are presenting, you're feeling more comfortable. Be aware of your body language and what it might be communicating. And now we're going to get to my, one of my favorite sections, which is what to do when something interrupts your flow. I think that this is actually one of the major vehicles of people's nervousness with public speaking. Um, if you break it down, if somebody says, I'm nervous about public speaking, if you ask them why, what makes you nervous? A lot of times it comes down to this. Common answers that I get are, I'm afraid of looking foolish. Um, I'm afraid of not knowing something. I'm afraid of being put on the spot. So I think the section here, what to do if something interrupts your flow, is hopefully helpful. These are tips that I put together on uh, things that you fear happening, things that I fear happening when I present. Uh, so the first one is handling unexpected questions. And I got the deer with the headlights, uh, the, the, the big eyes here, because this is often how you feel. Somebody asks you a question, um, a, a question just comes out of nowhere, and you feel utterly prepared to answer it. Uh, you might find yourself feeling like that proverbial deer in the headlights, like I wasn't expecting that question, I don't know what to do, and you find you just kind of stand there. First of all, recognize that this is okay. Nobody expects you to know everything. We have a tendency to inflate our own sense of what we're supposed to know when we're giving a presentation. And that can create a really fearful environment because if you feel like everyone is expecting you to know everything, chances are you're going to get a question you don't know the answer to and that's going to potentially unglue you. The most important thing to remember is not to just guess. Don't make up an answer. Uh, because if somebody does know the answer, they're going to know that you're guessing. They're going to know what the correct answer is. So you don't want to put yourself in that position. 
So what I have here are some potential responses that you can feel free to use if these work for you. One thing you could say is, I'm really not sure of that answer, but I know where I might be able to find it. Let me get your contact information after the presentation and I'll be in touch with you. So what you've done here is you've established that you don't know something and that's okay. But then the most important thing to do is to follow through, find the answer to the question and send that person a brief email. Hopefully you've exchanged business cards, you've got their contact information, so follow up. Because now you've accomplished a couple of things. In the moment, you've shown that you can keep your cool, even if somebody asks you something you don't know. You've shown that you're not above admitting that you don't know something, and potentially you've even learned something new. By them asking you that question that you didn't know the answer to and then pursuing the answer, you've broadened your own knowledge. So maybe next time you get the same question, you have the answer for it. And you've added a contact to your network. It's a way that you've actually engaged your audience after the presentation. So it's a great way to follow through. It's a great way to show that you are good on your word. And you've now made a new connection you've added to your network. Now, another thing that people can often fear is so-called brain freeze. Uh, this happens when you're in the midst of a presentation and you just blue screen, like you just absolutely freeze. Remember, this happens to everybody. We all have those moments from the middle of a presentation and you feel like you wish you were on the set of a TV show and you could just say line and get somebody to call your line into you, but then there's nobody there. So the important thing is not to panic. Remember that it happens to everybody. It is okay to say, you know what? I just lost my train of thought. Hang on a second. And then collect yourself. Look at your slide, take a deep breath, center yourself. Um, what seems like an eternity to you is really a split second of time that you're going back to that moment in Puerto Rico or you're going back to a time that you feel comfortable and you're centering your energy. It may even help to then start back at the beginning of that particular slide and just summarize what you said. Sometimes what that does is that triggers the memory in your brain of what comes next and you just can slide back into that rhythm. But the most important thing to remember is that this feeling happens to everybody. You are not unique in that sense. It is not something that's only happening to you. And another thing that's important to realize is that people are way more understanding than we give them credit for. When you're standing in front of a room full of people, we have a tendency to think, oh, they're expecting me to be perfect. They're, you know, they're thinking badly of me right now. Now I've lost my, my train of thought and they all think I'm an idiot. But in reality, people are a lot nicer than that. Um, think about how you would feel if you were in the audience. Maybe you've been at a presentation where you've seen somebody lose their train of thought. And in that moment, you were probably not thinking bad thoughts about that person. You were probably thinking, oh, God, I've been there before. Um, and you were empathizing with them. So just remember, people are typically more understanding than we give them credit for. So this is kind of a worst case scenario. But let's talk about dealing with hecklers. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, little online memes that went around. Oh, I'm sorry, did the middle of my sentence interrupt the beginning of yours? Uh, this is what we wish we could say in these situations. Unfortunately, most of the time we can't. So how do you deal with hecklers? If somebody interrupts with questions, not necessarily you know, bad meaning people, just somebody who interrupts your flow with questions, if the audience member has interrupted with a raised hand, remind them of when you're going to take questions. This is where it's really helpful to have said this starting out. So say, I'm going to take questions at the end. Keep your question in mind. I'll look forward to getting to it. Or in a couple of seconds, I'm going to be starting the next section. Uh, before I do, I'll be happy to take your questions. Now, worst case scenario, if the audience member has actually interrupted by speaking the question out loud in the midst of your presentation, answer their question very briefly. Don't give them too much of your time in that moment because you need to stay on track. Um, but answer the question really briefly and then say, any other questions I'm going to be taking at the end of the presentation, or I'm looking forward to hearing more questions uh, once we get to the next breaking point of the presentation. Now, it's probably not going to get to this point, our angry mob bearing the uh, pitchforks and torches there. Um, but if somebody aggressively contradicts you in the midst of your presentation, um, again, most likely isn't going to happen, but let's say it does. Sometimes dealing with fear means that you've worked your brain through the absolute worst case scenario. So if somebody aggressively contradicts you, don't become hostile, don't become defensive, keep your cool, 
center yourself. Be aware of that body language. Don't clench your hands into fists. If they're right and you're wrong, uh, say, I appreciate that information. I'll research it further. If you know for a fact that you're right, defend your point of view. But do it in a non-defensive, non-hostile way. Don't let it drag out, though. Other people should have a chance to speak, and you don't want to give that person too much of the floor. If they continue to keep trying to contradict you or they continue to hostily talk over you, say in that moment, thank you so much for your interest. You've given some really great feedback, and now I'd like to hear from somebody else who's been waiting to ask a question. And then point directly to somebody else who's been waiting and say, please go ahead. That way you're maintaining control over your presentation. You're addressing the person, you're not ignoring them, but you're also dealing with this in a polite and confident way that doesn't give them control of the room. Now managing technical problems. This is an actual image of real life gremlins, technology gremlins. Um, maybe it's not an actual photo, but it's how I always imagine them to appear. Um, I had a public speaking professor when I was an undergrad who said, don't plan for technical problems, plan on technical problems. Uh, that's why I was kind of laughing when we started today when I was afraid that the microphone wasn't working. I was thinking, oh gosh, she was right. Here it is, technical problems. Um, always have your presentation saved in multiple ways. Um, you can have it on a cloud drive, like if you use Google Drive or Dropbox. Uh, an easy way to do this if you're not on one of these platforms is just to email it to yourself as an attachment. That way you know you have it. Uh, you might want to have it backed up on a flash drive. I have a double flash drive system. I've got one on campus and I have one in my house that has all of my lectures on it as a backup. may not be the most up-to-date version, but it's something that I could turn to if a flash drive were to not work. When you experience tech issues, stay centered. Keep your cool. Your audience will not remember the computer rebooting, but they probably will remember you having a meltdown on the stage. So keep your cool, stay calm, stay chill, smile, look at the audience, and consider these courses of action. Let's say you're in a situation where you have to fix the problem. Something has happened that you actually need to go in and fix it before you can present. Address it directly. Say to the audience, I'm gonna need five minutes to relaunch my presentation. Let's take a quick break and come back at quarter two. Or, you know, put a time in there to tell people when to come back. If you're in a situation where you have to wait for somebody else to fix the problem, let's say it's an IT issue that you can't fix, you've got to wait for someone to come in, um, whatever point you were at in your presentation, go into detail with whatever point you were at. Um, tell an interesting research-related anecdote. You know, while we're waiting for them, uh, I, this point in my research brings to mind an interesting story that I experienced when I was collecting this data and then tell that anecdote. You might want to bring up a point about your research for discussion. This engages the audience, gets them talking, and uh, it takes some time. You might have then taken some of that question and answer question time from the end and put it in the middle of your presentation, but that's okay, because at least it does something while you're waiting. You might want to ask the audience if they have questions for you. While we're waiting for IT to get to your, uh, what questions do you have for me? As a absolute last resort, you can tell a clean joke. Um, this happens, this might work if you just like have a moment and you need to keep things on track. It's only going to take a second. Tell a joke, gets people laughing, uh, but make sure it's clean. Make sure it is a all audience appropriate joke. So the big takeaway here is to keep calm. Maintain control over your presentation. When someone breaks your presentation flow, if you let it unglue you, it's just going to make it worse. Especially, let's say worst case scenario, you are dealing with a heckler who is actually trying to derail your presentation. Um, we've all learned this from schoolyard bullies. You know, giving them the power of knowing it's upset you makes them continue. It gives them power. It takes away your own power. So keep that control. Maintain control over your presentation and the floor. And also it lets other people, the other people in the room who are there paying attention and interested, it gives them the attention that they deserve. Admit if you don't know an answer. Don't let hecklers steal your show and have a mental game plan for any technology issues you may encounter. So I'd like to wrap this up. Uh, to recap, mental preparation for your presentation entails knowing that you have the power to set yourself up for success. Your presentation style entails speaking conversationally instead of reciting. Being aware of how you move when you speak, being aware of your own gestures and body language. 
Audience interaction entails knowing that you're talking to people, not a faceless mass. And if something interrupts your flow, remember to maintain control over your presentation. This is your moment, and you shouldn't let anybody else take that away from you. So I'd like to open it up now to question time. So I'm going to uh, stop the screen share. Speaking of tech issues, hopefully this goes right. And uh, we're going to go back now to the presentation screen. Again, if all goes well, here we are. And uh, I would like to open it up now for presentations. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And here we are. Uh, so, Amanda, would you uh, like me Rossi to? Said, yes. Uh, if you like, I can read the question out loud, and then you can answer it, and then I'll I'll uh, release the the question so that everyone can read that in the chat box. That would be great. Sure. Excellent. So, um, let's get let's get right into it. The first question comes uh, from Sarah. Uh, how do you first prepare for a presentation? I tend to write a full script, and I usually end up in reading mode as a result. Any tips oh. for someone who tends to over-prepare speech for a presentation? Absolutely. Sarah, that's an awesome question. Um, and I've talked to a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of professors who prepare lectures this way, um, a lot of speakers who will start out with a whole speech written out or a whole presentation written out. Um, the best way to do that is to start with what makes you comfortable in rehearsal. It might take a few extra stages of rehearsal, but my recommendation would be to start with that full preparation and then start taking out lines. Um, either do this on a Word document where you're actually deleting lines from it. Uh, you could even get kind of creative and use a Sharpie to kind of redact your own lines out of it. Start minimizing the information in a way that makes your brain comfortable. Like, yes, I know what's supposed to be next. I know what was in that blank space. And then slow but surely kind of work your way down to some key bullet points. Uh, work your way down to a few sentences, and then reduce those sentences to phrases. And this is where PowerPoint can be helpful because you can have a few of those phrases uh, with you as you're presenting, uh, so you don't feel like you're going completely you know, off script. Uh, but that would be my recommendation, just kind of backing yourself down uh, sort of essentially weaning yourself from those notes. Uh, but the process here is that it's helping your brain to remember everything, to rehearse in a comfortable way with all the information in front of you, and then slowly but surely starting to take some of it out. Does that help? Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, let's say you have a limited amount of time to present and you've practiced to that length. But during the presentation, you notice you're running low on time. Do you have any tips on how to stay calm and finish? And this is a question from Jonathan Garner. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and that happens. You know, it just does. Either a question takes longer than you expected. Um, this is where if you take questions at the end of your presentation, that can help you have more control over your time. Uh, sometimes, if you pause and take questions at different stages. Um, what can happen there is somebody might take longer on a question than you were anticipating, and then you find yourself with that backlog as you get uh, toward the end of your presentation. Um, but my advice is to structure it so that you take questions at the end, which gives you more control over the block of time that you're presenting in. Um, and then if you do start to notice that you are you know, running low on time, have a few points in mind that you could drop if you needed to. Or as you get to a slide, cover a summary version of it. That way, you're not speed talking through it, uh, but you're covering the main point, the main boil down point. And then you can always follow up with the audience and say, you know, I've got some more information on this. If you had more questions, we can get to that at the end. Or if anybody would like more information on this particular point, we can connect later. Give them an opportunity to get that extra information from you. Uh, but my advice there would be to, to just kind of go for plot summaries at that point. Um, but if you've rehearsed it and you know the length of time things are going to take you, um, that should set you up really well too, especially if you wait and do all questions at the end when you know you, you, you know what amount of time you have left. Hopefully that helps. Our next question comes from Carrie Bushway. Do you have any management tips for someone who develops a persistent cough during the immediate pre-presentation anxiety? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the cough is actually your throat tightening uh, and fear 
I can go into the details of the muscles that are tightening, but we're not going to bore you with that. Um, and this is a fear response. It's kind of a fight or flight, and the tightening of the throat tightens on the vocal cords, which then makes you cough. Um, I think that the calming techniques that I talked about might help you with this. Uh, if you take those few moments and center yourself, and the deep breathing is also going to do that as well. Um, what you're going to try to do here is you're actually shifting your body's responses. Um, that, that sympathetic function is that fight or flight, and that's making your body feel like you've got to prepare yourself uh, literally for battle, like that's what your body's preparing yourself for. Uh, but if you can center yourself and calm yourself, uh, it releases some of that energy, and it will actually release your muscles too. It will relax your muscles a bit. Uh, so the deep breathing, the meditation, you may even want to step into, you know, step into the ladies' room or the men's room or a side lounge or a place that you can actually just be alone for a few moments to calm yourself. And uh, by doing that, that should help to relax your muscles in your body. It's going to help you breathe better, so you're going to project better. And when you project better, that'll keep your throat from tightening as well. Uh, you notice throughout the presentation, I had a glass of water with me. Uh, I notice that sometimes as I'm presenting, especially in winter right now where the air is so dry with thermostats, the dry air can give me a cough. So I take a few sips of water as I'm presenting, and that helps your throat. And uh, that's actually really good for your throat when you're presenting too. So you may find that that helps to combat uh, that tightening feeling that you feel in your throat. Hopefully that helps. Next question comes from Jody Goslin Goslin, and she asks, do you have any tips for pushing through the adrenaline rush anxiety that happens when you start speaking and hearing your own voice? This is always my hardest first few minutes. I'm sorry, what was the end of that? It's always what? Uh, this is always my hardest first few minutes. Yeah, you know, um, it's mine too, to be totally honest with you. Um, that's where I've started having a little anecdote that I tell, uh, that little story that I told about my last name, uh, serves a couple of purposes. Number one, it helps people learn how to pronounce it if they're unsure of how to pronounce it for asking questions later on. Um, and it's also an anecdote that is kind of like my opener. Like, I feel comfortable with it. It's kind of a humorous story. I know people have laughed at it in the past, so I'm kind of gathering that it works well for a group. Uh, so I go to that story or some story like it. I have a few different anecdotes in my head that I open with. And opening with a funny story or with an anecdote, it does a couple things. It engages your audience right off the bat, and it also helps you get through those jitters. Uh, because I feel the same way. Like, if I were to just start jumping right into, like, introducing my educational background or my career background, um, I kind of find that I go into, like, that nervous, monotone kind of feeling. So by opening with a story, it relaxes you as well as the audience. So that'd be my recommendation, is find some little introductory story or some little quip uh, when I taught in Singapore, um, because I was usually beginning my lecture, beginning the semester with having just flown over, uh, there would be a tremendous jet lag, and I would always be jet lagged when I would be beginning presenting. And I would open by making a joke about it. That was like my running joke to begin every semester was joking about jet lag. And that did a couple of things, too. It relaxed me, got me through that adrenaline burst, um, and it also told my audience, hey, she's jet lagged. So it gave me like a little carte blanche. If I forgot something, I could just refer back to jet lag. Uh, so have some kind of little joke, some kind of little anecdote, uh, whether it's about yourself, introducing yourself, or something that's been happening to you, or a joke relating to the time of year that you're presenting. Um, by engaging with your audience through a humorous anecdote, I think that that can kind of help relax you as well. Next question comes from Benjamin Houston. Okay. Any advice for the tendency when using a laser pointer to end up talking at the screen? Oh, yeah, that's a really good one. Um, my clicker comes with a laser, um, which is loads of fun, not just for, for your pets. Um, yeah, if you, if you find yourself turning and pointing at the screen with your, with your laser pointer, uh, my advice is to practice doing that where you're aware of your body, aware of not, be aware of never presenting your full back to your audience. Uh, so if you're using your laser pointer, this means you're still standing and facing the audience, but you're turning for a moment to point to something. And then by doing that turn, it might be a little bit physically uncomfortable for you to get used to at first, but it's physically telling you, oh yeah, I'm not facing that way, I'm facing this way. So you turn to make your point, and then you come back to the audience. 
Um, and so, so be aware of your back. Be aware of never presenting your full back to the audience. And uh, that should hopefully get you out of that groove of turning and talking to the screen. Hopefully that helps. Next question comes from Matthew Bowen. Many experts talk about slide content and minimizing text versus images. What are your thoughts about so-called slidements? So-called what? Slidements. Slide I guess it's like a combination of slides and monuments. Uh, that's the best. I, I love hear. that. Or documents. It could be so many things. I've never heard that word. Thank you for that. This is exciting. Um, yeah, I I have to again go back to putting yourself in the audience. Um, you know, we've all been to presentations or lectures or some scenario where people had tons of text on the slide. We know what that feels like as the audience. Uh, so again, my advice is to minimize it. But I'm also not a fan of slides that don't have anything on it, you know, or just an image. I think that having some words helps to connect the audience to you, to your points, and follow along. Uh, people like to know what's coming next, and having slides with a little bit of language on it helps them to know what's coming next. Uh, but again, uh, the same advice that I gave uh, to the very first question that was asking about not becoming, you know, reliant on reading a document or over preparation. Um, is to try to minimize the amount that's on those slides. Enough that it just jogs your memory, keeps the audience keeping up with it. Um, but my thoughts on slide units is to try to minimize them, try to keep it, try to keep the slides minimal and aesthetically pleasing. A rule of thumb is if you're using PowerPoint, there's a feature where it will give you the option to split the text onto a slide. It'll ask you, you know, do you want to adjust the box so that the text fits in? If you've gotten to that point, you probably put too much on the slide. Like there's a reason PowerPoint sets those text boxes, those sizes for that content. If that happens, split it onto another slide because you are probably on your way to a slide unit, which is my new favorite word now. Thank you. And our last question comes uh, from Ann Deacon, uh, who is uh, very instrumental in ha helping this presentation uh, and connecting us with the doctor uh, yes. for this. So I want to thank Anne and give her a shout out. Uh, with that, the question is professionally, what are your thoughts on lightning talks? Do you find them effective? What are my thoughts on what? On lightning talks. Uh, what do you mean by this? Do you mean like a, a, a TED talk or a very brief, like the five minute kinds of talks where you have to cover so much information in a set amount of time? Oh, okay, so the five minute ones, yes. Um, that's what I thought you meant. I, I saw one of those in action recently. Uh, a professor for a class that I was taking for the second master's that I'm working on illustrated one of these. And um, I have kind of mixed feelings on them. I mean, if it's something that you have rehearsed down to the wire, I think it's excellent because you're fitting a lot of information into a little bit of space. Um, I think the fact that you typically encounter lightning talks in an environment where everybody is giving lightning talks, so it's a little bit more. Uh, congenial. People understand if you start running out of time and you end up, oh my gosh, really, really quickly trying to fit in the last couple points. People are laughing at that point. I think that it's good if it's that kind of environment, if people are, you know, all doing the same thing, because that's kind of the sport of it. Like, that's kind of the fun of it. Um, so personally, like, I wouldn't want to be doing those all the time, because I think that there's a benefit to having a situation where you can expand on points and take more audience interaction. Um, but I think as a fun way to get people involved in the topic or cover lots of topics at once, um, I think especially if everybody is doing them, I think it can be loads of fun and educational too. So, so that wraps up all the questions from the audience members where we're a couple minutes from one. Uh, I, I actually had a couple of questions. Um, how, how can I reduce the amount of times I say um during presentation? Okay, that's a good one. Uh, these are called verbal fillers, and we use these when we're trying to literally fill a pause. It's usually because you feel like you're trying to maintain the floor while you're thinking or gathering your thoughts. I had a, a public speaking professor who advised us to put a rubber band on our wrist and snap it whenever we did that. I don't recommend that because that gets kind of painful <laughs> after a while. <laughs> um, um, see, you got me doing it. Become aware of what your fillers are. My filler was the word basically, and once somebody pointed it out to me, I became just kind of painfully aware of it. The best advice that I can give for that is to watch yourself speak. And once you see yourself speaking and you hear the number of times you're saying um, 
I think that that just kind of raises your overall awareness. Like you don't want to make yourself feel self-conscious or uncomfortable, uh, but you do want to become aware of those verbal fillers. And also I think having confidence of knowing that the floor is yours, knowing that people are paying attention and listening is going to start to eliminate that feeling that you have that you need to, to maintain hold of the floor by using those verbal fillers. Thank you, thank you very much. And I, I must say on behalf of the, the, the attendees and the association, this was an awesome and very informative presentation. Thank you very much. It was very detailed and uh, a ton of tips I'm hoping to uh, incorporate in my, my, my presentation approach. Uh, we That's will awesome. have the recording up. Thank you. We will have the recording up on the association's website uh, as well as on YouTube. Um, you know, with the with the thanks uh, for the doctor to allow us to share that. Um, Absolutely. So look, look look forward to getting the update from us. Um, I, you know, I, anyone in in the, in the attendance, please uh, show show your thanks uh, uh, to our presenter for for an excellent excellent uh, presentation and and really uh, giving us her time and preparation for uh, such an excellent presentation. I'm so happy that you found it useful, and I'd also like to extend an invitation. Anybody has any follow-up questions, or if you'd like to connect, uh, feel free to send me an email, and uh, we can connect that way. I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you might have as well. So thank you so much for your time, parting with your time today to, to listen to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and with that all, uh, thank you. Uh, enjoy the, the, the cool weekend uh, here in the East Coast, if you're in the East Coast. And until next time, thank you and have a good day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, I believe everyone has left. Okay. Goodbye.